So we move to a panel conversation, which all our uh, speakers this morning are participating in. So once again, if you if you came a little bit late and you're wondering who they are, by the way, you can submit questions over there. Uh, that QR code will direct you to a Padlet. Okay, but just in case you join us a little late, our panelists are Friar Robin Toha over here, Professor Christiana Zena, Mr. Eric Chua, Ms. Hannah Ng, as well as our moderator, Mr. Joseph Teo. Just a little bit on Hannah as well as Joseph, since they're just uh, they're just on stage. Okay, Hannah is a fresh graduate from the Environmental Studies program at Yale and US College. She's particularly interested in the marine environment, coastal communities, and questions around fisheries and development. Okay, apart from academics, she is also part of the Inter-University Environmental Coalition and was a youth delegate at COP28. Hmm, how about that? Mr. Teo, meanwhile, our moderator, is a keen advocate of sustainability and climate action. He's a member of Caritas Singapore's Care for Creation Committee. And get this, this one, when I read, I well, my eyes really big, big, open big, big, my eyebrow also got out of place, okay? He is Singapore's chief negotiator for climate change where he has taken on key international appointments, including co-chairing the inaugural global stock take of the Paris Agreement. You know when the names of these events are very long, means it's very important. Huh? And he was also uh, Singapore's deputy permanent representative to the UN in New York from 2015 to 2018. Blushing ever so slightly, over to you, Joseph. A big round of applause for all our panelists. Thank you so. Can you hear me? Yeah. So thank you so much, and uh, it's an honor really to be invited here to moderate this session. I thought I had the easiest job because I don't have to say much, but having listened to all the speakers today, it's not easy to find a coherent theme in terms of asking the questions. But I'll depend on you to pose your questions to the panelists. We don't have much time. I think we have till twelve forty. 12.40, so that's not much time. Each of them take 10 minutes, then we're already exhausted. So we may have to go one round of questions first. But firstly, please join me to thank uh, the panelists that have spoken before. Uh, I, I must say I was very inspired uh, by all of their sharings, particularly the last one. Uh, so please join me and thank them all. And we've got lots of interesting nuggets, huh? uh, uh, care for the soul, care for the community, care for people, uh, and of course, a lot of spiritual input from the Dato Sea, which Christiana has shared. So we very much are privileged to hear all the uh, sharings this morning. But we haven't heard from one particular person in this panel, and I thought I'll start off with her. But before I do so, I thought I wanted to draw a common theme and which is why we are all here today. Uh, a lot of Koyok on uh, what Monfort Care is doing, some Koyok on Conlink. Uh, uh, I won't say Koyok because I should not say that for Ladato C, but we know some input on Ladato C. But what I am interested to know, I don't know about you, but because we are all here to know what we can do we what inspires us how can we change and i thought i latch on to the 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 this word about conversion uh which uh, christiana shared which was in the ladato sea ecological conversion transformation and change and i thought i used that as a theme for the questions that i'll pose to each of the panelists uh maybe i'll start with the youngest uh, we've heard a lot of views from uh, uh, other people on the panel who have grown, uh, who are more mature. But I think it's important to hear uh, a voice from the youth and from someone uh, who is, is just starting out. And really, I come back to the team. The team is conversion, change. And so the question I pose to Hannah is, you know, and you have read her CV and she was just introduced, she was a uh, delegate at, at, at COP28 where I was as well. And she's taken an interest in environmentalism. But the question I want to ask, and uh, which I'll also ask the other panelists later, which I hope you guys are also interested in, is what made, what was the conversion for you? 
uh, what made you interested in in this particular topic? Uh, what made you want to change and do something? And I think that question is important also, and I hope each and every one of your the panel will also think about. Because end of the day, I think at the end of this social mission conference, we all must come back home uh, more inspired, uh, more changed, uh, and hopefully there's a conversion that have taken place already. I've done enough of talking. Over to the panel. Hannah, your views, please. Thank you, Joseph. Um, thank you, everyone, for having me. I think I was very honoured and touched to be asked to be a youth perspective on this panel. Um, so he asked about conversion, and I think in order to understand where my conversion came from, I'll give you a little intro about myself. Um, so I'm 24, I just graduated, like literally last Friday. Um, and so I really, yeah, just stepping out into the world. Um, but I've always been an ocean lover, and I've been involved because of this love for the ocean. I've been involved in a couple of like climate communities, including the ones um, they've mentioned before. Um, and I kind of wanted to provide a bit of perspective on what it's like, not just the conversion aspect, but I guess it's a youth perspective. Um, growing up, I think um, we've always been told like the youth are the ones who inherit the planet. Um, and I love the ocean, so I love to see fish. I love the coral reefs. Um, I hope that I'll spend my life hanging out um, with fish if I can and, and, and how that uh, interacts with humans, right? So coastal development, um, and in case you didn't know right now, we're going through the biggest coral bleaching event. Um, it's cyclical, so it happens every eight or so years. The last one was in 2016. But it means that right now, we're watching um, the reefs of Kusu, of Sisters Island. And these are just our reefs. There are reefs all over the world which are bleaching. Um, and this means that the base of the ecosystem is crumbling, right? Um, reefs can recover, but it requires action. And... It's not, it's like, so basically the reef will die in two weeks if the temperatures don't drop. Um, and usually what happens with these bleaching events is the temperatures stay so high for so long that they die off. And then you have to, humans come in and help to restore them. Um, so being a youth has also meant that I've grown up in a mindset of, I better go see these places before they're gone. Right. Um, which is really, really tragic. Um, I think it's also been to grow up in a digital age of like, news where you see violence, extreme violence, exploitation, death, extinction, like a regular occurrence in my news feed or on my Instagram page. Um, and so what do I do about it? I think in 2015 when Laudato Si was released um, and the Paris Agreement was signed, I came out of church one day after a homily about environmental stewardship and I was like, what can I do about this? Um, and that led me to change the course of my life. I was actually in Bali uh, doing a film diploma and then I decided I cannot spend my life doing these things knowing that there's this huge crisis ongoing. I need to do something about it. And I wasn't sure where to start, but I think it started with the really small things. It started with um, not this jar specifically, but a jar very much like this, of this size. Um, I decided to go zero waste for one Lent. Try to fit everything I consumed and that I threw away into this one jar. Um, and this was 2019, so I learned a lot, right, about what can be recycled? What do I need to throw away? How much is my footprint on this earth? Um, and I think that really brought me to the point where I had to do something more. So I joined an environmental studies degree program, uh, but not everybody has to do that, obviously. Um, for me, this was just a really a crossroads where I could choose to go into a place um, which I could learn more. And from then, I joined a lot more communities, communities which empowered me to go out and talk to more people. Um, and this small action of like trying to reduce my straws, my plastic, trying to do a zero waste land, um, deciding to join a degree program in a field which I thought was incredibly important, um, all stem from that question of how do I be a better steward? And that's led me to like be speaking in front of you guys today. So that's a little bit about my conversion story um, on how environmentalism has become like core to what I believe and how ca the Catholic faith has really kind of guided me through that. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Hannah. And that symbol of that nice uh, uh, plastic, well, plastic, okay, but uh, about what we need and what we want, uh, it draws the attention to to uh, to the very key issue. Uh, there are questions popping in, and I don't know if you guys are looking at them. I don't think we have a screen, but maybe as as we consolidate the questions a little more, uh, maybe I can turn to Friar, uh, Robin again. 
uh, thank you again for your very inspirational uh, opening uh, inter uh, sharing. Um, I think you you had put it very starkly about smell <laughs> and eyebrows, of course. But the question I have for you also, maybe on your personal journey, how do you move from the myself to the community uh, uh, part? And and I, I put that as a question because I also want to move on to other questions about community. Yeah? Uh, we are all part and we are all integrated in part of the community. But what's your story for moving? I mean, you did tell us about your realization as well, but how can your story and what's your advice to others who are sitting on the fence, still uncertain about what their contributions are, maybe still feeling that they're smelly, how can that make that leap over? I think the process for me was uh, a change of mindset, first of all, because the mindset is about me, my insecurity, my fear and everything. I must see beyond myself. So because as we, uh, we heard from other speakers also, that we are not living for ourselves. We are living for together about our common good, common home. And I think there's a, a perspective that I need to change in myself, that I'm not about myself. And then the other thing is that about conversion, about metanoia, it is about a process. Because especially my struggle, especially in Singapore, right? When we talk about change, when we talk about uh, conversion, we think it is a single process, just change like that. We come to the solution. But it, it takes a process. Like Professor Christiana said, it, is, it takes on and on, maybe the whole life journey. And I think it is very important for us, especially in the younger generation that I see. I journey with a lot of young people. And then the common thing that they say these days, right? I cannot find meaning in my job. So after a few months, after six months, I need to find another job. So I always ask them, because my own experience also, is your job is all about you. You ask our cleaners, the one who nursing in the hospitals, do they find the meaning in their life, in their job? Probably not in the job. Probably it is because they have hope, they have dreams for their family. It is about their family, about their common people. It is not about ourselves. And while if we think about ourselves, we always think about short-term solution, solution, solution. But it is about process. That's why it is called about transformation. And I think that's what I always believe in myself also, that I need to transform. So I cannot expect myself to change immediately. I have to convert immediately. But I must believe because the process of believing, hoping, it takes a long time. It takes a change of heart. In the, in, I mean, it is transformation. It is not a change. So I don't know whether I'm answering any question. Thank you uh, for underscoring the point about uh, transformation, process, and mindset change. Uh, maybe I'll move to Samuel. And the key question I have is for you is thank you for your stories and, your in, you know, and all that you are doing. How can we get more Samuels? <laughs> why do you want you, why do you want more Samuels? <laughs> okay, but it's a it's a thank you. It's a good question for me to actually I want to say something about Hannah. I, I don't know if this is my first time meeting her, but I must say I'm very inspired by what you have shared. You know, people are at age when we look at the other generation. We always say it type and then we think they are strawberry generation, work life balance, want to work for four days, work week. I mean, correct. Those of you are in management, wow, millennium with how I all this. But look at Hannah. All right, I think the millennium, I keep telling my management team in mental care that look at them differently. They are not worse off in terms of value. They are looking for meaning, value. And can we give that to them? You know, uh, we are starting a caregiver hub in Bernatown Point. So we are moving into this uh, ministry of uh, supporting caregivers. And one day, someone recommended me a group of young people. They are even younger than you. They are from different JCs, uh, probably just about to enter into university. And this few youth gathered together and formed their own group you know, uh, to promote awareness of dementia among the youth population. And they call their project Forget Me Not. 
And then I said, I want to meet them. So I had a dinner with them, you know. And these are all the young people. I tell you that night, oh, uh, wow, I come alive, you know. <laughs> I cannot imagine, you know, that, that, that. So I think, I think, you know, we, we must trust God. God is in every different generation. God actually raised up different people. And our job is sometimes to step aside. <laughs> Our problem our cock cock is sometimes uh, we think you are, we know the way and all this. Uh. So my answers to you is uh, we need more Hannahs, not Samuels. <laughs> Thank you, Samuel, for that very uh, inspirational uh, response again. And Hannah, again, thank you uh, for your good work. Um, back to uh, the question about community, yeah? Uh, and inclusivity. And here again, I must turn to this gentleman on my left. I have to call him SPS because I'm a civil servant. And I'm... But anyway, uh, so we have a question that is uh, trending here. Uh, um, and, and it's about uh, inclusivity um, as well as... Uh, um, maybe I'll ask the... So this is a question. So the question here, there are two questions. Maybe you can deal with them. How do you, well, the, wow, the thing is moving very quickly now. Okay, there is an increased call to reach out to the marginalized in society. Has there been any initiative to reach out to aging, transgender, low-income seniors? Uh, aging, uh, transgender, low-income seniors. So there are two questions. I think the first broader one, which is how uh, there is an increased call to the marginalized in society. And of course, the marginalized comprise a number of uh, uh, subgroups. And one of them, which has been identified in this question, is aging, transgender, low-income seniors. But maybe also you can broaden the issue to touch on other uh, subgroups. And of course, one area that you are also very concerned about is uh, the people with disabilities and special needs. Uh, so maybe I put that question to you. I, I think that's a, that's a fair and valid question. And I think there are many, just interestingly, I was at NIE last, uh, yesterday, yesterday morning for a, a dialogue with a group of teachers who are uh, just enjoying the last day of uh, schooling life, the last day in NIE. So after that, they are full-fledged teachers. And um, we had a discussion, uh, hard to hard talk about uh, the different spectrums on which discrimination lies. And there are many spectrums, uh, even in Singapore. Um, we talk about, uh, I'll just take the, the issue head on. I mean, one of the, one of the descriptors in uh, what has been said is about uh, a transgender person. So at that dialogue, we also talk about the LGBTQ community. Um, but it's not just the LGBTQ community that faces discrimination. I would say, and I went on to add on different spectra uh, that we can talk about. So for instance, seniors, right? Today, we talk about flexible work arrangements. We talk about, uh, you know, um, uh, making more provisions so that young parents can have an easier time, more facilitated time, taking care of the young ones. But we also talk about seniors' employment, but how many of our employers really do take an effort to think about the existing job, the different job roles in the companies, and then think about how we can critically redesign some of these jobs, such that these jobs can be broken down and, say, broken down into different pieces, such that we can have micro jobs that are taken up by employees who are of a certain age. Oftentimes, I, I hear seniors, and I have a lot of seniors in my in the constituencies that I serve. I serve Queenstown, and about 30% of my uh, 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 residents are 60 years and above. And one of the, the, the diff one of the community groups that I've been trying to uh, cajole <laughs> or try to persuade to work with is actually is Samuel. So it's very opportune that you know he's here with us today on the panel. After this, panel. I'm not going to let him go. He's not going to run away because I think there are things we can do together. And one of it is to look at how we can reduce perhaps um, the stigma 
that is attached and associated to seniors in terms of employment. All right. And I look at and I look at another spectrum, which is um, you know, there are local Singaporeans and there are local Singaporeans. What am I talking about? There are those who have been local for a few generations now, and there are new locals, new migrants that are here in Singapore. We often say, well, well, can be a bit touchy, but I'll just say anyway, I think we are mature enough to handle such conversations. We often say that, well, actually in, in Singapore, uh, let's talk about a, a minority group, right? Uh, we speak Tamil, right? Let's not talk in Hindi. Yes, I expect the silence, right? Because we have been a migrant society, but where does the give and take take place? Where does it take place? Is it about, you know, those who are new to this island called Singapore giving in? Or is it about those who are here already in Singapore for a few generations saying, okay, let's embrace the rest who are just here with open arms. I think there is no easy answer to any of this. And uh, one general rule, I, 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 one general rule that I typically advocate is this. Now, whichever group is in the majority, all right, would probably have the incumbent responsibility to at least show curiosity for the minority group. And I'm talking about not just the new locals versus existing locals, even those of us who have been Singaporean for several generations. Do Chinese know, uh, do ethnic Chinese in Singapore know enough about our ethnic minority friends, our Malay Muslim friends, our Indian friends, their ethnic practices vis-a-vis -vis their religious practices? I often ask this question and I ask, you know, in the IRO, we have a representation of 10 major religions in Singapore. And I often challenge the, the, the crowds that I speak to, can each of us, just in our hearts, all right, name out all the 10 religions that are represented in Singapore without any help and without the help of Google, uh, by the way. Yeah, no need, don't, go, don't go and search and ask Google. Google knows everything. I know that. Yeah. But can you in your heart say what are the major religions? Just after them in your heart and count from one through ten. Actually, majority of Singaporeans cannot. So then that begs the question, do we really know ourselves well? Hmm. So because we always claim that this is a multicultural and this is a multiracial society, but what is multiracialism and what is multiculturalism? Because it's not about, I would argue that it's not about uh, assimilation. It's not about getting all the ingredients. I get some of uh, Samuel, some of Hema, uh, Hannah. I will leave Fry alone. <laughs> and then I mix them into a puree. And then I have a kind of like a, a homogenous kind of a puree that is the end product. Is that what multiracialism in Singapore is about? Not quite. Multiracialism, multiracialism in Singapore is rojak. And I'm not saying anything denigrating to our setup. Because in rojak, what can you taste? You can taste the peanuts. You can taste a little bit of pineapple. You can taste a little bit of cucumber. You can taste the dark sauce. You can taste, uh, I don't know what other ingredients you have in Rojak, the yu tiao, right? The dough, the fritters, right? And you can taste a bit of everything. But on it, when you taste all these things in your mouth, just mixing and you're enjoying that Rojak, you know that it is Rojak. Because when it all comes together, it makes sense. But individually, you can still know the distinct parts. The peanut, the pineapple, the what have you, the cucumber. And that is the multiculturalism in Singapore. It's not about assimilation. It's about us distinctly still holding on to what we are as an ethnic group, as a religious group, but coming together, we know our overlay is we are Singapore. We come together during NDP. We sing our NDP songs fervently, right? And I think that's, that's what we, 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 we are. That's what we have been in the past uh, 50, 60 years.
and that's where we ought we hoped to you know uh, really move along of course we will have to really you know uh, evolve along the way there will be there will be tweaks we need to make along the way but as a society i think we need to recognize what our enduring values are and really preserve some of these enduring values for future generations so there are many spectra that we're dealing with there are many spectra we're dealing with and in, in terms of how we are um, making an effort to reach out to make sure that we are more inclusive actually there are many many things go- that are going on in different fronts and we haven't even talk- talked about you know the disability front for instance uh, and I've given one or two examples about caregivers and uh, persons with uh, both visible as well as in- invisible disabilities feeling that sense of discomfort and so it's just like um, in the 80s we used to have uh, campaigns right but do campaigns really work so well nowadays? I'm not sure, right? But we do still need to keep at what we need to keep at, you know, what we need to work on as a society. And there are many, many, many spectra that we need to work on. So I'm, I apologize. I've given a very long but answer that seemingly gets nowhere. But essentially, it, it, the, the, the short answer to all this is that there's a lot of work that we need to pursue in each of these quarters, in each of these spectra. Um, it's not easy because we are increasingly a pluralistic, a diverse uh, society where, where we have, uh, you know, viewpoints uh, and we have a lot of viewpoints that are also, you know, held by different quarters of society. And we do need to make this uh, a place where this marketplace of idea, ideas can continue to thrive and all of the views can be taken aboard without, without having any one particular group or subgroup feel like their views have been unnecessarily snuffed out. That is the last thing you want to do. Thank you. And my take on that answer is we are all different. Uh, We all need to be treated with dignity. We all can make a contribution. And the trick is putting all in that nice little pot uh, call a roja where it all can taste as good as this as it's in, in, instead of individually so I think let's try to create that roja maintain that roja and make it as delicious as possible um, okay another we're running short of time but I, it, I I want to draw questions from the audience and there's another one which has uh, quite a number of lights uh, and this question I'll direct to Christiana um, it says, and, and it may be a, a challenging one for you, but it says, how do we address spiritual and moral poverty in Singapore? I know you're not a Singaporean. Uh, we just uh, visited Singapore for two days. Uh, but I also note that you will be writing a new book. And uh, maybe this question might be pertinent one for your new book in terms of mm. what message can you give uh, so to your readers? Uh, maybe not all of them will be from Singapore, but, <laughs> but really, I think the reason why I put this question to you is what can we draw from the Dato C and uh, its, its sequel? And, and what message do you think uh, you, you wish to put in your new book that addresses this question? How do we address spiritual and moral poverty in Singapore? Because when we are rich spiritually, we will give materially. So that was the question. So it relates back to cry for the poor, cry for uh, the, the, the earth. Um, what are your thoughts and what are your messages? That is... A really important question, and I'm honored and humbled to be asked it, um, especially as a guest in your home. And I have to say, everyone I've met here has felt like a friend because of the welcome and because of the care. And listening to the presentations today and learning from each of these esteemed experts, I'm so humbled and energized and feel deeply in my heart the commitment to lifelong learning and to seeing what it is that each person with their knowledge, with their skills, can see about society and how the care 
how, how you can mobilize care into not just an individual expression, but into a social form. And I've had, I've been near tears actually several times. I don't normally say this when I, when I come give academic talks, but this is a different kind of thing. I, I have been near tears because the integration of care for the dignity of people through the substance of water and bathing and the ways in which um, the various projects of your ministries strive to uplift dignity through people caring for one another one-on-one -on -one. it's it's mediated by these relationships and so to come to the question what what I hear in that is this this common refrain that what is sin but a failure to love and so what is moral or spiritual poverty but a failure to care for the people and the realities and the entities who are right in front of us um I don't know that I have a better answer than that, but I think that, that the requirement of care and of looking and of being willing to see something that perhaps we resisted before and to work on that resistance in ourselves, to ask why are we resisting? Why, are, why am I condemning? Am I afraid of something? Is there something I can learn? How can I be curious? What would that look like? That, I think, is one of the ways out. And I think it's not an accident, then, that in Barato Si especially, the subtitle is Care for Our Common Home. And there's this refrain, not just of interconnectedness, cry of the earth, cry of the poor, but the moral invitation is to care and to open ourselves up to care. And that can take a lot of courage when there's so much need in the world. Um, but the way that that is happening in the ministries of Caritas and in the work of Singapore government and public service has made me so emotional and thankful because it is not a vision that I see in my society and it gives me great hope for who we can be as humans. So I would encourage you to keep doing what you're doing and keep opening your hearts in those ways. Thank you. And I've been told I need to wrap up. Um, so there are a lot of interesting questions here and a number of them are actually directed at Mr. Eric Chua. Um, I, I will not use this panel discussion to, one -off, to let him monopolize the discussion because my job is to give everyone a chance. But I'm sure you will be staying for lunch. And, and if you are, uh, for those who have your questions uh, on the screen, on the the the, the QR code, uh, which each and every one of you uh, have access to, uh, please approach him or other members of the panel to tap on 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 their uh, insights uh, further. But maybe as we uh, close this panel discussion, I will give maybe one minute uh, for each of the panelists again, uh, and I come back to the this theme of conversion, change, and here we have. Uh, a group of dedicated people who who already care and taken that first step. But uh, we want to go beyond this group. So the question I have for you is, again, what message can you give to each and every one of them uh, uh, in terms of what more can they do uh, to answer the call of uh, uh, to be stewards of creation? So um, maybe I'll start with Hannah again. Okay, um, so actually I prepared a little bit more um, just now, but I, in the interest of time, I cut a bit short. So I'm just going to share the last bit, which was really how um, in becoming more, in becoming a better steward, becoming a better Catholic or becoming a better person, I think for me, it's always been about doing something small, right? So today I will not use a plastic straw. And then... Two years later, that was, I will fit 40 days worth of waste into a jar. I mean, obviously that was not fully successful, but it taught me so much about what sustainability is and how difficult it is, right? Um, and so I think it is just about doing that one thing today and then doing that one thing tomorrow and then keep doing all those small things. 
Um, and I also wanted to echo your point um, about openness. I think when I was reflecting for today's um, panel, I was thinking about how much um, empathy has grown me as a person to be able to care for the environment. And, and, and in that extension of care to humans and non-humans, it has grown me to see the small things that I can do in my daily life in the one thing here, one thing there, until it's so much bigger than I could have ever imagined. Thank you. So do one thing. Friar? Uh, for me, I think we just need to realize that we need one another. I need other people in my life. Because whether we like it or not, our world, the social media, everything teaches us that we don't need anyone. Love ourselves. Do you know the best song for Grammy Awards this year? Flowers. I don't need you to buy me flowers. I can, my, I can love myself better. I think that's the, the unconscious thing that we keep on receiving. But let's always seek the truth. Seek the truth, who we are, what we are meant to be. And I think take on that journey step by step towards to become who we are. Okay, that's it, Sergio. Maybe I, I will end by a more practical... I feel, I feel that... You know, in the past, doing social work, doing good, is really, you know, like mass law hierarchy. You just help people with poverty. That's how social work started, even in Singapore. But as we advance, you know, it's not that we don't have poor, but poor take a different form. And in today's more sophisticated, you know, uh, society, it becomes more and more difficult uh, to handle such situation. So I really hope that, you know, the Catholic community can rally together to support Caritas to take up their leadership role because it's really not easy. And one aspect we have not touched in today's contact is, I'm sure Mr. Eric Chow will also know his mental health. <clears throat> and that is a very big part and it's very difficult to solve. You really don't know, you know, and today as young as teenagers and all this, up to young working adults, and, and so we need a multidisciplinary, collaborative kind of, you know, effort. And I think in this part, you know, for the Catholic community, Caritas play a very important role. So I, uh, let's pray for them and let's support their work and all come together. I, I mean, yeah, since, you know, one way that attracted me to actually uh, come and join Boy Star and Catholic is I'm very inspired by in the 50s and 60s how the catholic you know the different religious orders come to singapore and really take the lead and they become you know the pioneer and the very important in terms of shaping the social service landscape here so i really hope that to get today if we work together as a community we can actually uh again you know uh take that leadership role thank you so all of you matter, value yourself and do more. Uh, Eric? Being seated beside professor, I must make sure that I tell her I'm a good student, even though I sit on the last two rows, typically at lecture theatres, but I did my homework. So this uh, late night, last night, I went to, to uh, read up the Laudato Si. And it's long, but I'll quote um, two statements from that very quite rather lengthy, long, lengthy but thoughtful document. And I quote paragraph 229. And I quote, We must remain the conviction, regain the conviction rather, that we need one another, that we have a shared responsibility for others and the world, and that being good and decent are worth it. And another line from another paragraph, paragraph 232, Society is also enriched by a countless array of organizations which work to promote the common good. Around these community actions, relationships develop or are recovered and a new social fabric emerges. I think that is exactly what we want to do right here in Singapore. I, I, I mean, it was quite an uncanny, an uncanny resemblance to some of the things I read in, going around in, in, in government that we are trying to have a form a new social compact, that we are trying to have um, a, a Singapore that really have different quarters care for each other and how actually individuals like Hannah 
and many all of us in this hall rather we can all take action to be a part of this uh, this ship that we call this red dot that we call home so i found a lot of resonance in these few statements that i read and i just wanted to end by sharing with everyone in this hall today thank you thank you so a roja of individuals contributing to make the society better uh last word to the person that have traveled far to arrive here and over to the professor thank you I will take all these lessons and pieces of advice to heart. Mine is twofold. One is that intergenerational learning helps us all see better. So I have so much to learn from the people who have lived more and differently and longer than I have. And one of the privileges of being a professor is that I constantly get to learn from amazing humans like Hannah as well in ways that open my eyes. And those, those learnings go multiple ways. So in the community work, in the action, let it always be together and let it be intergenerational because we see better when we see together. The other thing I would say for anyone who is wondering where to get started or how or how do I even begin or what do I even do, uh, I'll just tell you what I tell my students when they don't know what to do for a project or a paper. And that is, well, I'm not going to give you the answer because there isn't one. There are many, there are many directions. So what you have to do is figure out what you love. That might be sea turtles. It might be wastewater. It might be plankton. It might be solar energy. It might be food waste. It could, you know, it, it might be Brussels sprouts. I don't know. Do you eat Brussels sprouts here? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Wonderful. Fantastic. Um, it could be anything. It could, no matter no matter how seemingly silly, quirky is what humans are. So we may as well live into those loves and delights and let that draw your delight forward. Okay, but if that's still not working for you, then what you do is you look for what really makes you mad. And you say, this is driving me bonkers. This seems not right. There is a tension here. Something feels off. What is that? And I've had some uh, conversation with Brian, who trained as an engineer earlier, about something feeling not right or feeling uncomfortable or even perhaps angering. Listen to that emotion. That is a kind of information that deserves to be explored. And there is almost always an insight there that you are uniquely poised to pursue and that others will resonate with too. Thank you, Christiana. And I think that brings us to the close. And I'm a bit five minutes over time, but uh, I think given the responses that we had, it is worth that five minutes extra time. And so please join me in thanking again the, all the panelists that are here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph, as well. Big round of applause for our moderator and all our panelists.